set aside our differences, and we do have differences. We're a very divided nation, but we're not going to be divided for long. I've always brought people together. I know you find that hard to believe, although this group probably doesn't find it hard to believe. But we are going to bring our country together, all of our country. We're going to find common ground, and we will get the job done properly. And welcome back to Hannity as we continue. We're in Cincinnati, Ohio tonight, where President-elect Donald Trump and Vice President-elect Mike Pence are on their thank you tour. And the Vice President-elect joins us now. Uh, is it, should I call you Governor, Vice President, Vice President-elect? I mean, you got a lot of titles still, right? How are Just you? Just call me Mike. Good to see you, Sean. Good to see you. It's great um, to be in Cincinnati. And, uh, a lot of excitement here, and uh, yeah. but, uh, but the president-elect and I are really just here to say thanks. Thanks to the people of Ohio, Kentucky, Indiana, and really all across America for giving us the opportunity to serve. And you know, you told me a big part of your speech is thank you for giving the, us the chance That's to. Right. That's right. Explain that. Well, I, I, I'm going to say to the people tonight, thanks to you, uh, we're going to have a president. Uh, who will unleash the boundless potential of the American economy by cutting taxes, rolling back regulations, thanks to you. We actually have a president-elect who's already saving jobs in America. We just had a rally uh, earlier today in Indianapolis where because of President-elect Donald Trump, uh, 1,100 Hoosiers are going to have jobs at a factory that was going to close and move all those jobs to Mexico. So my message tonight is just to make sure that, that people know that that the president-elect and I are working every single day to build a team, to lay out an agenda, to make America great again, and to keep the promises that he made, and it'll all be thanks to you them. Know, that's not insignificant, because otherwise it would have been 1,100 families going into Christmas, that's right. not knowing their future, worried about their mortgages, their, their cars, their kids going to college. Yeah. That's a big deal. And on top of it, I was interested that the, the CEO actually said they're investing 16 million more dollars in right. the plant there right and maybe 35 million more total in the state yeah I have to tell you uh, yeah. it, it really was remarkable to watch the president-elect exercise leadership in this case we you know <clears throat> Indiana's a prosperous state we, we have job announcements all the time really in spite of what's been coming out of Washington DC we've been holding our own but this last February, we learned that here's a company that had been around in Indiana since the 1950s that was going to close its factories and move, move all those jobs to Mexico. When I knocked on their door and said, is there something we can do? They said, it's a made decision. But just, just about a week after the election, President-elect Donald Trump picked up the phone, called the chairman of the parent company, United Technologies, and said, look, we're going to cut taxes. We're going to roll back regulation. We're going to have trade deals that put the American worker and American jobs first. And we'd, we'd like you to rethink this. And they said, we will. And uh, we started those conversations. But I think what people see in, the, in that effort in, in President-elect Donald Trump is, is a man who keeps his word, uh, a man of action, and, and a man who is not going to rest until we get this economy moving again for every American. You know, you know what President Obama said about this? And I was playing it on my radio show today. Well, what's Donald Trump going to do? Wave his magic wand? <laughs> and I thought about it, and I said, no, what he's going to do is what you didn't do. He's going to pick up the phone pick and call. Phone. <laughs> right. And I, were you there for that call? I was, I'm interested. Did you? I was any, there. You I was there, there when he did call. it. Yeah, he picked up the phone, and he spoke really... One American to another, and he just said, I, I'm just calling to tell you that we're going to do exactly what we said we we're going to do. We're, yeah. we're going to cut taxes on job creators, businesses large and small. We're going, to, we're going to roll back the avalanche of regulation. Back in March, the, the leadership of Carrier told me what was driving them out of the country more than anything else was an avalanche of red tape coming out of Washington, D.C. And, and, and what the president-elect told the leader of that company was, was we're going to do exactly what the American people elected us to do. And, and he asked them very, you know, very graciously and in his own way to, to if they'd reconsider that. And, and uh, I, got, I got to tell you how inspiring it was for me. Mm. Um, and your home state, yeah. As, as Which, a, by the way, has been doing well, as you pointed that's out. That's right, but... 1950s is a long time. It was inspiring for me to see uh, the way that, that our president-elect just leaned into that effort, kept his word, his son has made him, a difference in the lives of 1,100 Hoosiers. son calls him a blue-collar billionaire. Probably a great <laughs> example, right? You know, it's funny. I went out earlier before you guys got here in the crowd, and I talked yeah. to a lot of people, and, and this issue of carrier came up, and... What was the most important thing? What was the most important thing? I kept asking. He's going to keep his promises. Right. And they said this was one of them. 
And when you think about it, the agenda, if you break it down, and I talked a lot about it in my closing arguments, you said you saw the night before the election. I did. Supreme Court justices, originalists, right. vetting refugees, repatriation, 15% corporate tax, Obamacare replaced, health care savings accounts. Mm -hmm. Then you got building the wall, education back to the states, energy independence. What am I missing? Um, not a whole lot, although there is a little bit oh, the more. Military. Uh, there is a, we're going to re rebuild deal. the military. We're going to support law enforcement at every level with mm -hmm. the resources and the tools they need to restore law and order to our communities. And, and the list goes on. But you're absolutely right. I, I have to tell you, uh, in addition to being vice president-elect, um, mm -hmm. Uh, I, I've been asked to chair the transition and, and to see the caliber of, of men and women around this country who he is drawing to this effort, the cabinet appointments he's made so far, and there'll be more appointments next week, stay tuned. Uh, but, You're not going to give us a sneak preview. Okay. But, right. uh, but I, I just have to tell you, it's been exciting to see the energy, the vision, and the leadership that Donald Trump talked about on the campaign now being implemented by President-elect Donald I don't see him take a lot Donald of days Trump. off, and I know you're in a lot of these meetings, and he's included you a lot. You told me the other night. Um, this is what I think is that people want to know, that those promises that he made are going to be kept. And I think this is where Republicans, and I speak as a conservative, where they lost me a little bit. They promised to repeal and replace Obamacare. You, right. get, you know what a phony show vote is, but they never put the teeth into it. Or right. stop executive unconstitutional amnesty. Give us the Senate. You got the Senate, they didn't do it, they funded it. Things like that, I think, really annoyed a lot of people. It's important to keep your word. It is important to keep your word. And, and, and President-elect Donald Trump is a man of his word. I will tell you, he's dispatched me to Capitol Hill. We both went there together a couple of weeks back already sitting down with the leadership of the House and Senate and laying out a plan not just for the first hundred days the first two hundred days to implement that agenda and you know you've known him a lot longer than I have you know this man is the very embodiment of optimism and energy and creativity oh, he and, controls and he's, the room. he's gonna yeah. bring all of that to Capitol Hill and we're gonna drive that Trump agenda forward and we're gonna make America great again. how did it go when you were there yesterday because I know you were there yesterday speaking with a lot of these leaders how how was how were those meetings great discussions uh, we yeah. really brought our, our legislative teams together, yeah. uh, met with the Speaker, met with uh, uh, Leader McConnell uh, in the Senate. Uh, and, you know, our, our effort is to be ready literally on day one, to be able to walk uh, the, our new president uh, into the Oval Office uh, to take action on day one uh, on a number of executive orders uh, that uh, the Obama administration has put into effect, but literally in that very moment to initiate efforts to re repeal and replace Obamacare, to end illegal immigration once and for all, and to get this economy moving again so with important. less taxes, less regulation, and it's exactly it's exactly the agenda that he ran on, and, and, mm. and uh, I, I keep telling members of Congress, buckle up. <laughs> it's yeah. going to be a busy year. Listen, that's a big agenda. If you got all those things done, I would say it's a prescription. The conservative solutions that, that I've wanted for a long time. How has your life changed? I understand you guys don't fly in the same plane anymore. True? Um, for the most part? Well, that, that's right. That's part of the new changes. Uh, but, um, How else you has know, your life changed? To the extent you can share it. Well, it, in many ways it really hasn't. Um, you know, this was, a, this was just about a a 24-7 campaign for us before. We, my family and I poured our hearts and souls into this. The greatest privilege of my life. But as you said, there wasn't any vacation after Election Day. We were <laughs> first thing the morning after the election, we were all rolling our sleeves up, standing by our president-elect and helping to build a government that can begin to implement that Trump agenda on day one. And, and frankly, the, the, uh, the, 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 the energy, the enthusiasm, uh, the optimism that, that just emanates out of our president-elect is contagious, and it's going to carry us all the way to January 20th, and, and I think carry us to a, a great, great term in the I, don't, the, I didn't have enough Congress. time to ask him a little bit about foreign policy. Is the Iranian deal done? Will that be eliminated? Do you think, as he does, that that was a horrible deal? I think it was a horrible deal, but a lot of the money has already been transferred. Right. And I don't believe that any place, any time inspections will ever take place. And I don't trust the Iranians. And while that deal was being negotiated, believe it or not, they were chanting death to America, burning the American flag and burning the Israeli flag. Well, the idea of transferring $150 billion uh, back to ransom the Iranians. Payment. Uh, well, the nearly $2 billion in what was unquestionably ransom payment is deeply offensive. It was a bad deal. Uh, and we've already begun uh, internal discussions. I know the president-elect is going to give very careful consideration to the right way forward, but it all begins by recognizing how deeply flawed 
the Iran deal is and, and, and laying before him all the best options that will put the interests of the United States uh, and the interests of our most cherished ally first. Do you know if any countries like Iran, China, Russia, have they reached out? Or you can't say? It's well, fine if you can't. Whatever. Well, I, I can tell you the, 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 the leadership in, in China and, and Russia have reached out. I, for my part, I've, I've spoken to foreign ministers and some heads of state around the country. But frankly, from the day after the election, leaders from around the world were, were reaching out to our president-elect. Hmm. I mean, I, I really do believe uh, that, uh, that people across the globe, leaders across the globe, uh, recognize... Um, uh, recognize the the kind of leadership uh, that President-elect Donald Trump is going to bring to the White House, and they've been reaching out with graciousness, engaging directly with him, and mm -hmm. he's been engaging with them with with the kind of uh, uh, the kind of considerate, straight talk that I know will always characterize the way he deals with the world. Will we repair our what I would say is somewhat broken relationship with Israel? I've known Prime Minister Netanyahu for many years. He actually put a blurb on my first book. Will that relationship be repaired quickly? I, I can assure you that if the world knows nothing else, it'll know this, that America under uh, a President Donald Trump stands with Israel. Uh, he's had uh, uh, great discussions, as I've had the privilege of having with Prime Minister Netanyahu since the election, and, um, and we're going to continue to build that relationship. Last question. Can we glean anything from all the time you spent both at Trump Tower, New Jersey, on Capitol Hill, that the role of the vice president in this administration is going to be a pretty active and busy one? It looks like it. Well, I, I would, you know, I, I'd leave that to the one person who will define it. Um, I mean the guy who's been sending you around all the time? My, <laughs> my family and I are here to serve. I mean, you have to understand, I'm... I'm a small town guy from southern Indiana, not too far from where we're standing yeah. right now. The very idea of, of having a chance to stand next to uh, our president-elect uh, at such a momentous time in the life of our nation is very humbling for me. Uh, and uh, I'm just prepared to serve in any way that I can help him move that agenda that, uh, that we both know will make America great again. Mr. Vice President-elect, good to see you as always. Thank you so much for being with us. Thank you, Sean. I would rather lose than win the way you guys did. No, you wouldn't. No, you wouldn't. Yes, no, you wouldn't. Absolutely. Yes, yes. No, you that's very clear today. No, you wouldn't, respectfully. Absolutely. Do you think I ran a campaign where white supremacists had a platform? Are you going to look me in the face and tell me that? It did. Kellyanne really? did. Oh, it did. Oh, we were right. It did. Oh, Do you think you could have just had a decent message for the white working class voters? Do you think this woman who has nothing in common with anybody... I'm not anybody, saying that's what you won, but that's the kind of campaign that was flipped run. It over yes. 200. How about it's Hillary Clinton? She doesn't connect with he people. How about they have nothing in so, common with her. After every presidential election for decades, Harvard has had a postmortem. And Tucker Carlson joins us right now. Uh, it has always been civil until yeah, yesterday that's right. when the Clinton campaign attacked Kellyanne Conway. Right. And, not so, and, and Jen Palmieri, who I've known for 20 years, she's a very smart and reasonable person, actually. She's one of my favorites on the Clinton team, has clearly bought in to the storyline that they all now believe, which is this was a moral contest. Not a contest between opposing ideas, but a contest between good and virtuous people and evil people. They, and they believe, of course, they're on the good and virtuous side. This is a really ominous sign because it suggests two things. One, the Democrats believe that anyone who disagrees with them is evil. And two, they haven't actually thought through what happened. They've learned nothing. Mm -hmm. They believe that Trump got elected because America is racist. Boy, that's not the right conclusion. Well, look, you, you look at them and they just, they, they blew a, pow, a, a great big pile of dough right. in losing. Right, yeah, and they clearly, sure. like you said, haven't learned because we saw that with Nancy Pelosi. They reelected her. Well, yeah, but imagine, okay, so if, if you and I are arguing about an issue, I think, you know, I, I really like Ainsley, but she's just wrong on that issue. Yeah. But if the debate is over who's going to heaven, then I look at you and I'm like, you know, Ainsley's just not a good person. Like, we, it, it is a deep and unbridgeable divide. Once you start framing politics in moral terms, this is a dangerous path to go down. I agree. Let's, don't, do, let's don't have that conversation. I, well, I want to go to heaven. Ever met, so it doesn't <laughs> apply to you. But I'm just saying, they actually think that America is a bad country filled with evil, racist people. People, and that's why Trump got elected. Whoa. Yeah, you know? and that this election's an exception. I mean, look at Keith Ellison, the nomination of the DNC. I mean, is, right. there, is, is this something that's not just a Clinton camp thing? This is a Democrat left-wing party thing.
saying, hey, the right is all evil, we're going further left. Yeah, I mean, of course, the irony alarm goes off because it's Keith Ellison who called for, like, a separate ethno state yes. for African right. Americans. So, like, who's the racist? Okay, but <laughs> leaving that aside, that's a symptom of something else, which is profound disunity on the Democratic side. What is the Democratic Party? It was the party of the working yeah. class, yeah. of the farms and the factories. Now it's what? The party of Black Lives Matter or of Bernie Sanders or of the Clintons? Those are three very different groups, and it's not clear sure. who runs that party. Plus, and fold into all of this casserole, the uh, the recount this is going the Clinton casserole. <laughs> the uh, the recount. I found a hair in mine. Oh, <laughs> sorry, 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 I'm sorry. That is so wrong on so many levels. Uh, oh. The recount ultimately the goal there is just to leave a stain on the beginning of the presidency of Donald Trump. Yeah, I mean I think so, but I also believe that a lot of Democrats believe that the underlying charge is true, which is that Russian agents somehow got a hold of voting machines in rural Wisconsin, Michigan, and Pennsylvania and tampered with them, though they're not connected to the internet. They believe there's no way he could have won unless the people are racist or the Russians got involved. One of President Reagan's cabinet members, Bill Bennett, is comparing President-elect Trump's actions with Carrier today to those of his former boss who took on the air traffic controllers after they went on strike illegally. President Reagan told the air traffic controllers in no uncertain terms, you better come back to work or else. The union demands are 17 times what had been agreed to, $681 million. This would impose a tax burden on their fellow citizens which is unacceptable. It is for this reason that I must tell those who fail to report for duty th this morning, they are in violation of the law, and if they do not report for work within 48 hours, they have forfeited their jobs and will be terminated. And he made good on that threat, changing uh, the, the strike history that we would see of these kinds of unions for years to come. Bill Bennett is a Fox News contributor and former education secretary under President Reagan. Bill, great to see you. First, let's talk about Donald Trump's speech Thanks. tonight. What a, what, a, what a speech it was. Optimistic, you know, at times strong, at times a little threatening of those who would cross America in his view. Not dissimilar from what we heard from Ronald Reagan. That's right, uh, but it was uh, it was vintage Trump. Very funny, I think, when he was on the text, reading from the text, and then when he departed, uh, I preferred the departures from the text. Actually, I would be just just as happy if he didn't return to the text. But but both parts were good, a very strong, and he's the same guy. I think that's the thing. And my comparison with Reagan is that when Reagan did the air traffic controllers firing, everybody said, "Oh my gosh, you know, this guy is serious." Remember, Ronald Reagan was called an amiable dunce by Clark Clifford, part of the Republican establishment. People didn't know what we were getting, or at least Washington didn't know what it was getting. The people knew. Uh, and, uh, and when he got in and did this, people said, my gosh, he, this guy is serious. He means business. That's what Trump did uh, in Indiana with the carrier thing. Two things. He showed that he meant what he said. He said what he meant. And second, he showed that he remembered what he promised during a political campaign. You know how cynical people are about American politics? Here's a guy who said something. Before he's even president, he acts on it. American people like mm -hmm. that, and I did too. What do you make of, uh, you know, obviously he did not keep the promise to go after Hillary and put her in jail, and he got some heat for reversing right. himself on that promise, and a couple of others last week. This one actually leads to real American employment and jobs kept here, which may be more important to the American people, but how do you square those two? Well, bo both are both are consistent with Christmas, I would argue, and uh, and before Christmas, <laughs> I, you know, the, the Hillary thing that can that can still be covered by other people if 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 it needs to be if an investigation is warranted. I don't think people are worried about that. She's out of the picture. The Clintons yeah. are done. Uh, she's out of the picture. But this was was yeah. a reminder that the guy meant what he said, and he means and he means business. And now we'll see what else. Mm -hmm. But the other thing I mentioned was about the cabinet, because people have been saying, you know, the never Trumpers, uh, with whom I was arguing, a lot of my old friends said two things they were sure of. One, he wouldn't be elected because uh, Hillary would bury him. Well, that was wrong. The second thing is he's no conservative. This cabinet, these picks so far are not uh, uh, the most conservative by a Republican president. President since Reagan, they're the most conservative, including Reagan. I was there. I sat around that table. I knew who those folks were. Look at this lineup. I mean, well, you have Price, you have uh, Jeff Sessions, you have you have Flynn, uh, you have Betsy DeVos in education, and now Mad Dog Mattis. By the way, it's nice to have a general named Mad Dog. I think. I, yeah, I wish, so I wish General Keen hadn't told. 
Well, I wish Cheryl Keene hadn't said he meant it for his own troops. I'd like the other side to think he meant it for them. But I imagine he can, uh, he can be pretty tough there. The warrior monk, they call him, because he reads books. How about that? Generals read books. Yeah. Yep. Well, what do you think about the never Trumpers? Do you think they're coming around now? I and mean, I feel like a lot of these Republicans who oppose Donald Trump are suddenly looking around and saying, this is actually great. We control the House. We control the Senate. We've got a Republican president in the White House who's saying all the things that we have believed in, maybe not the trade stuff. But apart from that, he's saying a lot of things. That the, I mean, that speech tonight was a speech 80% yeah. of which, 85% of which most Republicans have been dreaming about for at least eight years. Yeah, no kidding. Well, I haven't heard from them. I'm still lonely for lunch, but that's okay. Uh, maybe maybe you'll come <laughs> and you, you, you and I can have lunch. But uh, but I do Any notice time. that some of them are trying to get on the trans, they're <laughs> trying to get on the transition team, and they're looking for positions uh, in the White House. And I've talked to people, a couple people, who said they were on transition. I said, did you vote for Trump? No. Did you support him? No. I said, well, I'm going to turn you in. I don't think you should be on the transition team. But in any case, uh, I haven't I haven't heard people saying, gee, you were right and we were wrong. I haven't heard a whole lot of that. But you've got to be impressed with these picks. If you're a conservative, you have to be very yeah. pleased. Administration is personnel. I mean, I ran three federal agencies. Administration is personnel. And when you hire conservatives, that means your government and your policy will be conservative. Okay, before I let you go quickly, what do you, what do you think? Who do you like for Secretary of State, who you hope he picks? And they mentioned, he mentioned, we're going to get to this in a minute, possibly Sarah Palin for the head of the VA, who is a controversial figure for at least half the country. What do you think of, the, of those two positions? Well, I'm pretty loyal to Fox, so I'd like to see my old friend Pete Hegseth get that VA position. He's uh, going to be on tonight. Secretary He's State, coming on. Well, good, good. You tell him I'm supporting him. But in terms of uh, Secretary of State, a name that's not on the list, and I don't know why, uh, and that's John Kyle. I think John Kyle is one of the most capable people ever to serve in the U.S. Senate would you, and knows foreign would you policy. Stick to but the it's list. a good list. Stick to the list, Bill. Yeah, okay. I'll stick to the list and I'll go for Giuliani. I know, you know, at, look, I have trouble with the Romney thing. I just thought he was so far uh, out, of the, out of the realm of fairness in, in terms of what he said. So, he, he was so personal, so nasty, yeah. so uncalled for by Mitt Romney, supposedly a gentleman. So I'd be for Giuliani. But if Donald Trump was, will forgive him and say, fine, I'll follow the example of my leader. Bill, great to see you. Thank you. We're hoping Geraldo Rivera was watching. Were watching? <laughs> yeah. you watching? I was, and um, I'm very proud of the way he has conducted himself as president-elect. Uh, it's been with dignity. There is, you know, only a, a minimum of gloating. There is more pride. You uh, would have gloated more. I'm, I'm telling you, after pulling off the biggest political upset in the history of uh, modern politics, I would have gloated much more than he has. I absolutely am totally in favor of every one of his uh, designated cabinet positions. I think Mad Dog Mattis is a brilliant choice. Uh, you know, of course, we interviewed him in theater a couple of times over the years. He's a fighting general, uh, you know, the warrior monk and so forth. I think it'd be great. It, not only will he uh, know how to conduct war, but I think that he'll get the bureaucrats in the Defense Department, and there is a plethora of them uh, in line, trim that aspect, the non-fighting mm -hmm. aspect of the Defense Department. I think it'll be terrific. Well, I tell you what, since you brought up Mad Dog, who apparently does not like to be called Mad Dog warrior unless, monk. You, unless you are a Marine. Unless, or the Commander-in-Chief. <laughs> <laughs> Good enough. He, he, he right. shared that uh, little nugget of news with his vast audience out there. Don't tell anybody. Okay. okay. Keep a secret. But what did you make of just the fact that, did you, first of all, at, to Ainsley's point, it was a thank you. Thank you for voting for me. But at the same time, it kind of, since he hasn't had a press conference in a while, it reminded folks of what he hopes to get done as quickly as he possibly can. And in fact, yesterday, even before becoming president, he saved... 1,100 jobs. And that was fantastic. First, let me congratulate our best-selling author in the middle of the Kirby couch. Yes, indeed. And right. also Thank her you. excellent Thank interview you. with the president-elect. Uh, I thought that it was very uh, uh, informative, and it was great to see him in, uh, in that mood, uh, reflective but still triumphant. Uh, I, I just think that he's moving in exactly the right direction. Uh, the carrier thing, it may be symbolic in the big picture, but to the 1,100 families or so directly affected, 
it's going to make, as you've been reporting all morning, a very happy, happy holiday. Uh, in terms of uh, how he is moving forward, remember all the stories of uh, a disarray and disruption and anarchy and the transition is in chaos and all the rest of it. And it turns out that he's ahead of schedule in terms of uh, historic comparisons. Very organized. And uh, his selections are great. I personally uh, would uh, really be in favor of uh, Governor Mitt Romney being selected as Secretary of State. But I think that, uh, you know, there are the other can they can't go wrong with the with the the, you know the quartet that he has mm -hmm. as as prospective choices. I think it'd be a great thing to reach out. It would certainly heal the GOP uh, in terms of bringing the establishment wing in with the uh, with the Trump wing. It's Trump's party now. He can define it as he will. And I just think that so far he has put people at ease. I think that's the most important thing. Uh, the office has uh, has the constraints of tradition and history. And and just as I thought would happen, and we've spoken about it many many mornings. The office is a, is a moderating force. The edge is off. I like the way he did not say uh, uh, lock her up, did not allow the crowd. The crowd did. Really. Yeah, mm -hmm. well, I, he didn't go for it. He right. didn't rise didn't to take the, bait. the bait. So uh, while there was obviously uh, exuberance in his triumph, I didn't think it was overboard well, at all. And what you've said, he threw out the rule book in the campaign. He's changed the nature of what a modern presidency is looking like before our eyes. Uh, last night in the rally, he talked a little bit about national security, not just Mad Dog Madison, that surprise announcement, but but also some of the policies that he would execute or will execute as president. Uh, here's a little bit of what he had to say last night about the war on terror, and then Geraldo will get you to respond to it. We don't need San Bernardino. We don't need another Orlando. We don't need another World Trade Center. We don't need Paris. You look at Paris. You look at Nice. You look all over the world. Look what's happening to Germany. We don't need that, folks. We have enough problems, believe me. Your state has just experienced a violent atrocity at the great Ohio State University that further demonstrates the security threats that are created, stupidly created by our very, very stupid politicians, refugee programs. So, Geraldo, he's not backing down on something like refugees and extreme right. vetting. Uh, what do you make of his, his... Well, first of all, my mother-in-law and father-in-law are Buckeyes from Ohio State. Uh, I was in Ohio when this, uh, this uh, incident, this uh, violent incident happened on campus. Uh, so it hit us uh, kind of close to home there. I think the problem I have with the emphasis, and I totally get that one of the reasons he is president-elect is that he understood far better than I how visceral the issue of refugees and immigration is. He, he, if you remember back to the days when he was on his golf course in Scotland, and Brexit had just happened uh, yeah. with Britain withdrawing from the European Union. Fifteen minutes Union. earlier. And, and he said, my election will be like Brexit. People are so uh, upset and unsettled by the changing nature of our countries, immigration coming in and changing the demographic nature and uh, uh, religion and race and so forth. The only thing I urge, and this is the caution, you reported earlier this morning, Steve, that over 700 people had been killed in the city of Chicago this year alone, far surpassing the 400 odd had been, who had been killed in 2015. Of the 700, zero, as far as I know, were committed by a refugee. Zero of those. That's not our crime problem. Is it an infinitesimal? Well, there's different problems. It is an infinitesimal percentage. In terms of the yeah, emotional but, investment we have but, to the reality it, on the ground, it's, it's there's almost a disconnect. It's an ideolo ideological enemy seeking to infiltrate our country and conduct war against us or infiltrate the minds of youth here. I That's don't, a very I don't deny thing. that at all. I think that that is a, an astute so apples a, a orange, definition of, of what's going on. But I I, I submit to you that the the inner city gangbanger doing a, a uh, you know fighting a rival drug dealer is far more severe a problem for the United States than the ideological but war. You're conflating. I mean, Trump has said he would address that too, right? Sure. By, there are two different issues, and he can I, deal I with both issues. But there are three quarters of a million, as far as I know, refugees in the country, beginning with the Somalians uh, uh, a couple of decades ago, or a decade and a half ago. As far as I know, there have been three acts that can arguably be called, be called terror, including what happened on uh, the Ohio State campus. So, so 789,000 and three acts. I think that we have to but keep it in be perspective. More. I just want remember the Jews in World War II and the Ship of Fools. We didn't let the Jews of Europe 
come into this country on the eve of World War II for the same reasons. No, we didn't know who, reasons, who, was, who was hidden among them who could disrupt. But I think that we can't, that we can't <laughs> let that. We can't let that. The Jews of Europe who are facing ovens are different. It's very they different. Were, we didn't know from ovens. We, they were the other, and we excluded them. Right. 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 We, excluded them. They want we kept us. them out because they were the refugees, and they were for the same kind of, uh, I use the term already, visceral reasons. We have to be careful that we are not that place, that place that excludes the, uh, the, uh, the tired, huddled masses breathing to, uh, yearning to breathe free. We've got to be people careful. People just want to be safe. They want jobs. Extreme they want Extreme vetting is the way to go. Trump is right about that. But let's, okay. extreme we vetting well, is not exclusion. All right. all right. It's extreme, though. It's extreme. <laughs> all right. <laughs> and so is Geraldo. I, That's why he's on every Friday. <laughs> Try the Thank deal. Thank you, Geraldo. All right. Thank you. Let's find out who General Mattis is. National Security Correspondent Jennifer Griffin is at the Pentagon tonight. Good evening, Jennifer. Good evening, Brett. Well, when I was on Capitol Hill earlier this week, I learned that Republicans on both the House and Senate Armed Services Committees had taken steps to write up legislation allowing them to make an exception and bypass a law that bars military personnel from serving as defense secretary within seven years of retirement. It would be a one-time law mentioning General Mattis by name. Chairman of the House Armed Services Committee, Congressman Mac Thornberry, told us just a short time ago that Mattis has tremendous support on the Hill. We have a draft of language that we have prepared based on the same language that was used for General Marshall back in the Truman administration. So that's our starting point. There may be some tweaks to it, but we're pretty much ready to go with that here in the House. Neither the Trump transition team nor General Mattis himself will confirm that its decision has been made. General J Jim Mattis's last job was that of CENTCOM commander before he retired three years ago. He oversaw relations with 20 countries. Before that, he served for three years as the supreme allied commander for transformation of NATO. I'm told he doesn't like being called Mad Dog unless you are one of his young Marines who gave him that nickname. During the invasion of Iraq, his call sign was chaos. He also led Marines into Fallujah and led a Marine amphibious task force into Afghanistan after 9-11. You go into Afghanistan, you've got guys who slapped women around for five years because they didn't wear a veil. You know, guys like that ain't got no manhood left anyway, so it's a hell of a lot of fun to shoot them. You know, I mean, it, it's a good fight. When he met with President-elect Trump, General Mattis reportedly told him he does not like waterboarding because, frankly, it doesn't work. I'm told by a well-placed source he was not told about the Cuban negotiations or Iran deal when he served under the Obama administration, even though Iran was one of the countries for which he was responsible. General Mattis was forced to retire three months early because he saw Iran as a greater strategic threat than others in the administration, Brett. You know, Jen, I'm told by Marines. Uh, who know him. Uh, obviously, he's blunt spoken, uh, straightforward, and as you, you mentioned in, in your report. Uh, but they, there's also this other side to him. Uh, after he retired in 2013, um, he got in a car and crisscrossed the country to try to personally visit as many of the families of Marines who died under his command as he could over a two and a half week drive across the country. And he wrote a handwritten letter to every parent uh, who lost a, a son or daughter under his command. So you don't often hear uh, that story. Well, that's the kind of guy he is, and already morale here in the building upon hearing that he might be the commander, uh, the defense secretary here, it's already rising. As CENTCOM commander, he made it a point to stop in Tonga, of all places, to thank them because they had the largest number of security guards guarding the green zone in Iraq. He also made it to Estonia. He made that a priority because Estonia lost more troops per capita than any other country in Afghanistan. Brett, that's the kind of guy he is. All right, more on this uh, with the panel. Jennifer, thank you.